Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Information's New Summer School. I'm Laura Mandero. I'm a senior editor with the Information, um, and I'm thrilled to uh, present and help moderate this conversation with Marcus Mabry. He was uh, vice president of global programming for CNN Digital, who's going to talk about bias and inclusivity in our jobs as journalists. Um, we hope you have lots of questions for him and uh, you can put them as they come up uh, in the tab on the right of the screen that says stage. And once um, Marcus is finished giving his presentation, uh, I will um, sort of look through and, and try to present them to him. So um, thanks again for coming and thank you, Marcus, for being here. Laura, thank you. Thank you so much for, for moderating this time. Uh, thanks to everyone who's joining us uh, from wherever in the world you are. Uh, good morning, good evening, good night. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you. Um, I'm just going to talk for about 10, 15 minutes about kind of uh, my path to here, uh, to where I am at CNN, uh, and a little bit about the issues of inclusivity and fighting bias, uh, especially amongst ourselves. Um, and then I really look forward to all, all your questions. Um, I wouldn't normally talk as much about myself, uh, <laughs> except for given who our audience is and who you all are, um, and that you're all tracing paths of your own uh, through this amazing profession, uh, I'm going to talk more than I normally would about uh, myself. So I'm going to go ahead and start sharing my presentation with you now. Let's see if that's the right one. You guys are seeing it, right? Make sure. There we go. There we go. Um, so this is, of course, the title of our talk today, to, tonight, this afternoon: inclusive reporting uh, and avoiding bias. Um, obviously, this is a subject close to my own heart after thirty years in journalism. Um, and as you all know, again, I'm the VP of Global Programming at CNN Digital Worldwide. Um, my path, and I'll talk more about what that means um, and what our team does at CNN. Uh, my path is uh, like some of you, many of you, uh, I started off as an intern um, and actually at Newsweek, uh, which is still uh, a <laughs> publication. Uh, for I'm, I'm, I'm chuckling because uh, some of you may know that Newsweek has existed in various forms. Uh, and the Newsweek I started at, you could call Newsweek Classic. Uh, was uh, the magazine started in the 30s in the United States. It was a global weekly news magazine uh, up there with Time magazine. They were fierce competitors. Uh, and Catherine Graham, the, um, the, the doyenne of American journalism uh, and of American media owners, uh, Catherine Graham's then husband, Phil Graham, bought Newsweek magazine. Um, the joke goes that Catherine and Phil were visiting New York City from Washington. Of course, she was the publisher of the Washington Post as well. Uh, and she had a headache. And she said, Phil, can you go, go out, run out and give me a magazine? And he went out and bought Newsweek. That's where the joke goes. Uh, so I started at Newsweek as an intern, um, actually in the Atlanta Bureau. And I, to go to Newsweek, I turned down internships at the Washington Post and the Los Angeles Times because it was 1988, and Newsweek promised me that I would get to cover a, an American political convention. So that's an amazing opportunity. It was happening in Atlanta. It was the Democrats nominating Michael Dukakis. Uh, I chose that over the other two opportunities. Uh, I was actually planning after my Newsweek internship, uh, I was planning to actually go to law school, but I'm from a family with a very meager means. Uh, and so I was worried about how my family would survive while I was in law school and I knew they needed money. And so uh, I chose to work in Newsweek for a year. And then after that year, I was going to go to law school. I deferred my admittance for one year. But after a year, I, I called up, it was Yale Law. I called them up and said, give my spot away. After working as a journalist in Newsweek for a year, um, I was in love with this profession. So I decided to do this for the rest of my life. And that was some you know, 30 years ago. Um, after I ended up spending 19 years at Newsweek as a foreign correspondent and a foreign editor. Uh, I largely, I was based in Paris and in Johannesburg, 
I got to cover Nelson Mandela. Uh, I spent 19 years at the Times. Then, uh, sorry, the Newsweek. Then I jumped to the New York Times, where I spent eight years. Um, and there I started as the international business editor uh, and went on to digital, made the move to digital while I was at the New York Times. And the reason I did it was because, as you all know, the Times does extraordinary journalism. But it was at the Times I realized if you're doing this great journalism, but you don't have a mode of delivery, of distribution to get it to the people who care about it, who need it or want it, uh, then that journalism probably is not sustainable as a business over time. Uh, and so that's what, and that's what digital is all about. It's about connecting content with audiences, news and information with audiences that are passionate about it. That's what digital is all about. So that's why I made the switch at the times. Uh, and then Twitter uh, was creating a new news product called Twitter Moments. And Twitter is an amazing tech company. And I want to know what is it like to work for a tech company? How do you handle news in a tech environment? So I was happy to go to Twitter. Uh, I was only there for a year before CNN had this amazing job open up uh, as head of mobile, uh, head of mobile publishing at CNN. Uh, I couldn't resist the opportunity to marry the, what I learned about tech and product at Twitter with news, which is my first love. So I, I came to CNN and I've been here now for uh, three and a half years or so. Um, I went from being in charge of mobile to being in charge of all of our platforms and to give you a sense of understanding of what does that mean. Um, what my job, global programming at CNN handles, of course, CNN's homepages, CNN's app, also the notification alerts you get on your phone. Uh, we also, um, my team works closely with Apple News and with Google News, the aggregators, and also closely with Twitter and Facebook, where CNN content is also seen. So this gives you a sense, this diagram gives you a sense of all the places we distribute CNN content. My, handle, my team handles the core, the social messaging, and the merging and off-platform, most of it. The one piece we don't handle is the video platforming. There's another uh, programming team that does video programming. Um, now, to get to the things we were talking about to, today, inclusive reporting. So what are we talking about when we, when we say it? Um, we're talking about reporting that includes not just the usual suspects and not just one demographic, say straight white people, um, but reaches beyond um, the accepted or the assumed audience, our subject, our source, right? Uh, to find diver diverse sources, for instance. Uh, when you're doing a piece, are you looking at not just straight white male experts, say you're talking about a, a epidemiology piece, uh, or you're talking about, uh, well, anything, real estate, uh, any subject you want. There are non-straight white men sources. There are female sources. There are people of color sources um, that you should also reach out to and make part of your source list. Um, when you're putting together a piece, there's also a question of the subjects you're using. Are you looking at profile? Uh, if you're looking at any type of profile you do, you can do um, with diverse subjects. Again, not just straight white men who are so often the go-to that we just fall into because they're easiest. They're everywhere. They're the majority. They're out there. Um, and, and then likewise, if you're doing subjects that often are uh, sources are, are female, uh, are, are LGBTQ, are, are of color, try then try the straight white male, right, for those subjects. Um, it's also inclusive reporting also touches on what you decide to cover. Uh, if you are a beat reporter, are you covering the same um, stories that everyone is? Or are you looking for, well, what are the stories that are uncovered? Who are the communities that are uncovered? And as a job, it's our journalists, of course, to reach out uh, and, and to make that kind of difference. Um, why does it matter? Well, I mean, I'm, I'm, re I'm really super happy to be talking to you guys today. Uh, again, my background is as an, an intern myself in, in journalism. So um, I, I ran the internship program at Newsweek. Uh, for five years, and we had you know, 500 applicants every summer, and we choose 12 of them. So I'm, I'm super used to this whole experience. I'm talking to you in this moment, though, about this subject because the incredible moment we're living through, and Black Lives Matters protest, and the social justice protest, and the racial reckoning that's happening happening in the United States and in many other countries. That that's why this matters at this moment. That's why organizations uh, that don't always look at these issues or care about these issues or caring right now. I hope it's not an aberration. I hope it continues. I hope we continue to dig deep because journalism gets better uh, the more inclusive we are and the smarter we are. My team is, is an incredibly diverse team. Uh, there is no majority of any uh, given demographic racially or ethnically on my team. And I think, you know, we, we 
are excellent because of that. We have the number one news platform in the world in English, I think because of our diversity. That's how we became number one team in programming. Um, the other reason is my kids. So my kids uh, are Gen Z. I have two 10 year old boys, uh, my partner and I, and um, Gen Z is really not here for the excuses. There are lots of reasons you can say why we're not inclusive in our reporting or in our news reports. Gen Z just doesn't want to have it. And some of you are members of Gen Z as well. Um, you know that, you know, you're, you, it's not a generation that tolerates the old excuses. Uh, so if we want to remain relevant, if we want to make money as ongoing business concerns, those of us who are for profit, uh, then we have to um, present a world that people actually want to read and see themselves reflected in, and want to watch and listen to. Uh, and then finally, our, again, our world, it's a diverse world now, not in the same way it was when kind of this industry was run uh, in one Target still is, but was run even more so universally by straight white men. Uh, second topic that we're talking about this evening, this, today, this morning, this afternoon, is fighting your bias. Um, what what I love about how how the question of how do you fight your own bias, um, it is incredibly sharp um, sighted and narrow minded to assume, oh, well, I don't have any biases. Well, we all have them. Everyone has them. Uh, the one thing you can be certain of is, is if you think you have none, then you're not doing a good job in fighting them. In order to fight them, you have to first acknowledge them. So whatever your subject matter, uh, whatever your POV, your point of view, uh, there's something that you come to this with, some, some body of perspective you bring to it before you tackle it as a, as a journalist. Uh, and if you don't acknowledge it, then you can't fight it. You need to acknowledge it first, uh, then to figure out uh, how do I fight it. And then the best way to fight it to me is always get enough perspectives, opposite or different perspectives on whatever story you're writing about. Um, and then test your own assumptions, things that you are certain about with regards to that story or that topic. Uh, ask the sources for the story um, those questions. So you, you assume that, oh, well, this must be, be true of, of everyone uh, given this, this subject area. Well, ask that question if you're so sure and see what the experts say. And make sure you have the experts from diverse or competing perspectives or points of view. Uh, and then finally, you know, check your gut or your emotions. If, if you're emotional about something, it, the audience probably will be too. So don't like, be afraid of your emotions, but delve in deeply. Why are you feeling uh, emotions around the story you're covering? Ask the experts uh, how other people feel uh, and, and, and dig down. Don't, don't fear your own responses. Um, there's actually something you should use and not run away from. Uh, there is this question, however, of when we talk about these notions of bias or objectivity, it's cousin. Um, there, there is questions, again, as we're examining everything in our industry right now and, and its roots, we also examine where do those concepts come from? Whose concepts are they? And there are many people inside and outside the profession who have this question of, you know, are these ideas that existed but were created in a time where it was a very narrow homogeneous uh, body that made up journalism and its its rules, its ethics, its deontology. Uh, and, and, and so, for instance, you know, if you go back and look at the civil rights era and those terrible battles happening uh, in Birmingham and in Selma and John Lewis, of course, a great rep, representative, representative from Georgia, who's lying in state right now in the U.S. Capitol, was a civil rights warrior. But if you look at the New York Times and Time Magazine from those eras, you'll see lots of stories about how, you know, Martin Luther King is, is a troublemaker and, you know, the blacks are looking to go too fast and, and it, it kind of it makes it makes you a little ashamed. Um, but that was considered objective objective. And I understand why we all understand why. But we have to examine at this point. We are examining in our profession uh, the roots of that. And that's going to be ongoing. Again, I hope for, for a long time uh, as we open our minds to kind of, um, again, biases that we didn't even know we had. Um, my last point on this is it's important to challenge our biases because it makes a difference in audiences. And right now, Pew did a great um, you know, their annual survey of journalism. Uh, and one of the you know one of the sad things in their last survey was that people who identify as Republican or conservative, uh, in very large pluralities at least, and maybe even majority in some cases, uh, don't trust the mainstream media. We're at such a point in our in the United States where we are so divided and divisive that we don't agree on what truth is anymore. The more journalists hone to what um, to, to our standards, I think the more important um, it is to try to bring those other people back into the fold. And I will point out that since um, since COVID became such a, a story 
Uh, we've seen CNN's audience, digital audience has grown by at least 50% uh, over normal times every single day and often up to uh, 100% or more. Um, that's because we've gotten lots of audience that used to be at other places because when you're talking about life or death, it's not a political partisan issue. It's about you know, you, people want to know the truth. And so I, I, do, I do take some heart from the fact that people of all different political persuasions are coming to us more, and that makes me think, know that we're doing something right. So just some takeaways for everyone. Um, inclusive reporting, include diverse sources and subjects, and I could add stories on that. Fighting bias, it's about checking yourself, uh, what are the biases you don't even realize you have, and then countering them. And then my, my last note is uh, keep the faith. Uh, it is not an easy time to be coming into this industry, but you all, by being a part of this group, uh, the Information News Summer School, you're part of a, a massive cohort that can really lean on one another. So as you go away from here this summer and look at um, the months ahead and the years ahead, and look at opportunities in the profession, um, lean on each other and support one another because you are a great resource for, for one another. And with that, I'm gonna wrap up and uh, see if you guys have any questions. I'll stop sharing my screen. Um, hey, Laura. How are you doing? Hi. We have a lot of good questions. We have some um, related to um, the subject of inclusive inclusiveness in um, journalism and then some just about general journalism. So I'll tackle awesome. the first ones. And um, there's a, a question about um, what you're saying and um, sort of the crisis situation uh, regarding local news, where we've seen a lot of um, layoffs and, and closures of newspapers, um, and how um, that, your, your view on how that's affecting inclusivity in news, um, and maybe some what you think could be our way out of that. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, there's definitely a crisis, as we all know, in local news. Um, a, lot, a lot of it, I think, comes back to the sustainability argument. I said the reason I got into digital is because, um, and it used to be a bad word, things like monetization and stuff uh, inside the newsroom. We didn't talk about that. And we were kind of this wonderful, you know, um, monastic order where we didn't worry about dirty things like money. Uh, but jour journalists can't do that anymore. We have to be more rounded than that now. Um, no point in complaining about it. It's just the way it is. Um, I think local news has been one um, victim of that lack of kind of sustainability, a sustainable model, business model. Um, I, I, I do think it affects um, um, inclusivity and, and diversity. Um, ironically, not necessarily racially or ethnically, because a lot of those local outlets were not terrifically diverse when it comes to the way we think about diversity, but just their existence, right? A small paper in the Midwest, I and mean, just its existence and adding to the inf information ecosystem is di adds to its diversity, right? The fact that uh, any user can go online and go to El País or Le Monde and also go to you know, the Scranton Daily Herald, you know, um, that's not a real paper, but it's a paper in Scranton or, you know, in, in Pennsylvania uh, or, or elsewhere uh, in back in the, out in the Midwest. That that adds to the diversity of our industry, right? And, um, and it's important. Um, I, I wish I had business answers for it. I think it's going to be a combination of uh, not-for-profits. Uh, you guys will hear from the Texas Tribune um, um, president on Thursday. Uh, that's a not-for-profit, excellent journalistic endeavor. Um, ironically, you know, in the national and international media, it's been uh, well-heeled people uh, like Bezos and the Washington Post has made a difference. Um, and, and, the, and to its credit, the Post is also, I think in some ways, it has ambitions that are more, the Washington Post, ambitions that are more local uh, than it's had in a long time, uh, not just to be a national or international uh, organization, and that's really, really good. Um, and then maybe some of you will also find out there, will find the models that are actually sustainable for hyper-local, as we love to say now, as is, is all the vote. Um, but it's going to take a lot of work and a lot of ingenuity uh, in the years uh, and months to come to, to make local sustainable. And it's super important. I mean, I covered lots. In the beginning of my career, I covered lots of, uh, you know, as an intern, intern at the Boston Globe before I was an intern at Newsweek. Uh, I, I was an intern at my local town, Trenton, New Jersey, my hometown before that. Um, I covered lots of school board meetings. Um, and that school board meetings matter a lot to people's lives. Yeah, very much so. Well, the the, the um, uh, we've got a couple questions, uh, Marcus. Um, and this is a this is really to the point of uh, talking about diversity of sourcing. Um, 
And I think it came up a lot in the last couple of months um, uh, around the Black Lives Matter protests. As people try to get diverse sources for an article, how do, how do they avoid putting pressure on, on those sources, perhaps tokenizing them or putting them in a vulnerable position um, as they you know, seek to include them in articles or other coverage? Um, you know, it, it's, it's not easy. It's a really good question. Um, I mean, I remember a very analogous situation where uh, I interviewed a serviceman, an African-American serviceman a long time ago when I was at Newsweek uh, as a reporter covering the State Department. And he had some really critical things to say about his service and about American policy. And I said, and he wasn't someone who usually talked to the press. So to me, it's different when you're talking to a congressperson or someone who is a public figure versus a private citizen. And so th th he had no idea the hell he was in for. And I warned him like three or four times. I said, are you sure you want to do this? And all this on the record. And, and he was adamant because he felt passionate about it. But, you know, he did pay a price, right? Um, and I think that that can be true for protesters today who are ordinary folks. Uh, and some of them say, well, I'm going to speak freely. I'm in a peaceful protest. I'm going to do that because that's part of my, you know, right as an American citizen. So I'm going to do that. Others don't feel comfortable. Others may not know the risk they run. Um, and the risk may be different. It may be changing before our eyes. And so we don't really know as journalists um, what kind of risks they incur. I think it's really important, though, to have those sources. So you come up with whatever is comfortable for you as far as identifying them or not identifying them uh, if you're in a visual uh, medium. Um, and certainly it's easier if you're in a text medium not to necessarily identify them. Um, but you, know, you have to negotiate it with them. And, 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 and if you have the time, some of these are really, really fast interviews in the middle of breaking news, in the middle of chaotic situations. So you may not get to do all that, you know, consideration with the source. Uh, and then you have to make your best guess possible um, about kind of what 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 is the right thing to do. Um, I wouldn't worry about tokenizing because it's funny. Um, if you have more than one or more than a few, it, it's, not, it's not a token anymore, right? Uh, I am super sensitive uh, as, a, you know, African-American LGBTQ parent journalist. You know, I'm super sensitive to, to tokenism. Um, because I'm, I'm often one of the only ones wherever I am. Um, and so it's super important. I'm happy that we're aware of that. But in the same way, if you don't give us a voice at all, then we're still marginalized or out of the picture. So it is really important. Most important is that we're present, that we're there. Uh, and if you can see our face when it's possible, that's great too. Because that, that's the most important thing is we enlarge our universe and talk to people who we once didn't even talk to as journalists. There's a couple interesting questions around um, casting light or on um, people who, um, you know, maybe will encourage others to do harm. And I think this actually has come up. Um, this wasn't part of the question, but very specifically with white supremacy. Do you profile these individuals if somebody reading it might get inspired, but other people want to know about what's going on. How, how do you, what are your thoughts on that? This is uh, an issue that we face every day. It's in um, you know, lots of stories right now about lots of different white supremacists uh, and white supremacist affiliated organizations. Uh, QAnon is a, a big one right now that we're all talking about. Um, and sometimes there are things that come up that are particularly vile um, or offensive. Uh, and, and there's a, a concern amongst people in the newsroom if we share this thing, we're giving it a megaphone. We're amplifying the message. We're, you know, we're allowing hundreds of millions of people, literally, to connect with this with this information. We wouldn't want that, right? And, and so, no, we wouldn't want that. At the same time, and this is the debate we have in the newsroom, we can't pretend it's not there because it is there. And and the model of journalism, of course, is you know to bring light to where there's darkness, right? So that if we expose it to light, we hope. That, that will make a difference um, because again you know this is all happening these supremacist groups are operating they are recruiting young kids on the internet who are unsuspecting through youtube it's all happening so i do feel like i always lean on the side of it is better to expose it than to not uh because it's not going to be our coverage of it to me it's going to convince someone to go that way if they were so inclined it would happen anyway but people around them in their lives their parents their loved ones may find out that this exists it may look for signs, it may be able to help someone. So it, I, I do lean on that side, but it's not an easy answer. 
Definitely not. Um, there, there are some good questions here about um, balancing your personal um, life, and and um, you know, if you're a journalist of color, uh, maybe you're uh, dealing with racism of the, uh, going on nationally in your everyday life inside the newsroom. And then I guess I would add to that question if there's something even as um, you know specific as terminology for a group um, that that you're disagreeing with your editor or your editor's editor, if you have any advice on how to handle those situations. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, these are real. These questions are real. And I really appreciate them. So thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know of any journalists of color who haven't encountered racism in their newsroom. I don't know any of them. Um, so <laughs> uh, it, 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 it's to be expected. Um, it is something we have to gird ourselves to and have to work through as journalists. And even saying that, that's a lot because we don't have to. You can say, well, I'm not. that's not fair. I'm not going to tolerate that. So either I'm not going to be associated with this organization um, or I'm going to demand a change. I like the demand a change thing better because we have to be here. If we're not a part of this profession, if we're not in the newsrooms, if we don't have a seat at the table, then then it's less likely things will change. I mean, they're certainly, you know, excellently, uh, you know, right thinking um, people who are not people of color, right? Um, white journalists who care a great deal about these issues, who are fighting very hard for inclusivity and for fighting bias in their newsrooms and for eradicating systemic racism in their newsrooms. They are legend, right? They're legion, rather. There are a lot of them. Um, but we need to be here too, right? Allies alone can't do it. We all need to be here. Um, and like I said, diversity leads to excellence. I've seen it in my own team. We're not the number one news programmer team in the country, you know, in the English speaking world, according to the, the metrics, and we are massively diverse, majority diverse. So uh, it's really important we be here. Um, I, I, but I, at the same time, and I say this to like LGBTQ journalists too, for things like coming out, we each have to make our own personal decision. Um, I can't demand you have to come out if you're LGBTQ. Um, that's not fair of me. That's your decision to make. I know it makes a difference being visible and I know it's the same thing with you know, a journalist of color. It makes a difference having our voices there. Um, we have different degrees of comfort in raising those voices and the frequency in which we raise them and, and, and the, the, the volume with which we raise them. Uh, and you know, I think all of us have to pick our battles, decide what are we going to let go, what are we going to not let go. Uh, and again, saying this, like saying this to my Gen Z kids, they'd be like, nope, not going to do it. Ridiculous. You sound like a moron. And in my, my kids literally say that, obviously, because they're my kids. But uh, and, and I can't argue against that. They're right. It's not fair. It shouldn't be. But it is, you know, it is what it is. And and if you want to make a difference, you have to play with this world for now. Maybe you can remake it, right? And I don't – I think that's very possible. That, too, is a power of Gen Z to me. Uh, same, thing, same things that are one way and remaking them. Uh, Florida gun laws and what happened in Parkland and the Gen Zers who led that fight. That's an example. They actually changed the laws in Florida. So, so I, I, it's not a great answer I'm giving you. Um, I, I encourage you to speak out. Um, for one thing, there's a point in which you have to be your authentic self. And so you, you're not going to be able to not speak out ever. That will crush you and you will say, and you, you will say, I have to get out of this place. So in order to change any place you love, you're going to want it to change, number one. Uh, and so modulate where you, where you, you can make it, where you can speak out. Modulate when you need to go talk to an ally, someone who's not of color, you know, who know things like you do, and say, "Hey, can you help me out?" And the next time, can you bring this up, or can you take it to the editor now? Um, allies are super important. A support network is super important of people who are like you and people who are different from you, um, who can be kind of your kitchen table um, cabinet, your sounding boards. That support is super important. So you don't think you're the only one all in, up there by yourself, you know, fighting the fight because uh, you're not. Wherever you are, you're not alone. And so reach out and find out who the sources uh, of support are, both within the organization and also without them, outside the organization. You would have friends who are smart, you can you know, go to and just like, ah, let off steam in the way you couldn't in your newsroom because it wouldn't be seen as politic. Um, again, that's the world we live with now, and that's the advice I'm giving for now. But I hope you all will change that world and make it <laughs> infinitely more just. There are uh, a bunch of questions about um, uh, how, how as journalists we can rebuild trust in the media, which is a big issue. Um, 
but I know one that you probably think of, about every day. Um, and in that, by extension, you know, seeing people share things that are not actually um, journalism or something that's fact verified. Yeah, it, it's, it's, we have we have all the easy questions tonight. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, it, it's a massive challenge um, because you have this techno technology allows more kind of um, this misinformation, disinformation out than ever before. And again, we're in a, a, a nation, a society in the U.S. at least that's more divided th than at any time you know since probably at least since the '60s and perhaps since the Civil War. Um, I mean that those two realities together are just mind bog make it mind boggling difficult to kind of fight. Um, I mean, our answer in a way it's, it's in a way it's an easy answer, but it's not. Um, it's seen that we, we we make a a big deal of the truth, right? So we're, we're going for facts, and I should actually say facts rather than the truth because people can debate their truths. There was a time in which you know uh, when when I was you know was born, I guess, but even most of my time growing up, in which you know. In the United States, we watched three different network shows for news. Walter Cronkite was there, and we all believed him. And he said something was true. We all believed it. Um, now, that was maybe white, male, and, and uh, uh, homogeneous, but um, he was a trustworthy voice. Now, we don't have that same reliability anywhere, largely not because journalism has changed, but largely because the device, how the divide the society is. Um, so what that means is, and this will we adhere to at CNN, is, Fact, 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 fact. We just keep hammering on the facts. Now, it becomes a problem when, with, say, this president, who, you know, the Washington Post has, has you know, chronicled every lie he's told, um, when he so often does not hew to the facts or actually goes in the opposite direction of the facts and states untruths and, and, and sometimes lies, meaning he knows it's an untruth. Uh, that's the difference there. Um, it means journalistically we could just report what the president says or we can say well that wasn't true and because we are sticking to the facts we do have to say that wasn't true now those who are partisans well some of them at least not all of them but some of them will look at that and say oh, look at that you're calling the president a liar you're not fair you must not be objective but if we keep coming back to fact 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 we hope that that will eventually win over audience who right now doesn't believe even when facts are presented based on who they're coming from if, if, if you know your mainstream media you must be lying um and this that's a kind of reflexive thing we're fighting right now in our profession but um i don't know if we ever have seen it like this to this degree in this country um and i do i, I keep thinking if we keep hewing to the facts i keep talking about the facts uh and, and, and again i take some heart from the fact that our audience has grown um since COVID happened because people do care about the facts when you're talking about life or death it's one thing if you're having political debates. Okay, yeah, that, that, but when you're talking about life or death, what you need to know to survive and to keep your family safe, um, people still come to the mainstream media. Um, and that's, again, and often to CNN. So it gives me, uh, it gives me some hope that if we keep sticking to the facts, um, more people will find that to be useful in their lives. Um, I, but, I, you know, I, I don't know when it's going to change the divisiveness in the country. It may matter who the president is. I mean, the president may set an example. So I don't know. Um, there's a, there's a, a couple questions about a sort of, uh, you referenced the questions, uh, sort of the debate that's gone ongoing about objectivity. And if that was, I think maybe people had read this uh, New York Times opinion piece by Wesley Lowry about um, objectivity and how that was um, really defined by um, white editors. Um, how uh, how can we approach that, or maybe a better way of uh, framing it is, um, should journalists try for pure objectivity or should they kind of uh, accept that they come with some bias um, or a point of view and make that clear to the reader um, and and say things with authority um, based on their own experience? Um, and that may be evolving and in, in your kind of perspective on that evolution, I think would be helpful. Yeah, that's it's, it's, a, it's a great issue we're facing. Um, so the last few things I've written, um, and I should have popped them in, so I'm sorry I didn't, uh, but you can Google CNN and me, um, and maybe her why, uh, you'll see them. Um, the very last thing I wrote was about being um, a, an African-American male. 
in in America and, and, and encounters with police, encounters with police, uh, and, and what it, you know, the difference between my life and uh, my, my white partner's life, uh, who's a white male, and you know, I, I start the the piece of, and it's, it's an opinion column, right? So it's not news, although it certainly is, is news in a way that you know when we why we were doing it as a piece. Um, but, you know, that, that is all about my personal experience. Um, I don't know if, and, and so it, it comes from that and it, it's clear about it. I don't know if in a news piece, you know, look, I've been in the business for a long time, right? So I don't know if in a news piece there'd be the same, I mean, it feels a deep dive into like this issue uh, of the police and African-American men. Uh, I can see doing it. Um, it'll be rare and it'll be, uh, it will be a kind of a special thing. There'd be a reason to call attention to who I am and why I'm, why am I doing this? Why am I giving you uh, my, my personal story? Um, it's not bad. Uh, I kind of love the idea of it um, as a news piece uh, doing that. And again, but it, it will stay, I think it'll, that will remain a rarity in our business. And I'm, I'm okay with that. And I'm okay with that because um, I do think, you know, checking your bias. So, I think for me, as an African American male, if I was going to do a, a news piece on that, I, I would. I'm very aware of my opinions. I would definitely check all of them with the experts and with the police I interview. Right. So I, I'd be looking for. A, I'd be looking to. Deep. I'd be looking to prove what my perspective was. I'd be looking to prove my perspective wrong. And I think that's always useful to do. Uh, and and frankly, if 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 straight white men did it when they're reporting stories, writing stories. Uh, look to prove themselves wrong and their perspectives wrong, then they it's good for them too. It's good for every journalist because it allows us to test our biases and we have to confront them. And that's really, really, really good. That's a great place to start. Um, my, my one other note on this is, of course, it's an American journalistic deontology. Uh, there are other places in Western Europe, for instance, uh, where traditionally media doesn't go for this objectivity thing that American press goes for. But there is a right-wing paper and a left-wing paper and a far-right paper and a and a far left paper, and a centrist paper, and a center right paper, and a center left paper, um, traditionally, um, in say France and the UK. And so if you want those different views, you have to read a, a, a spectrum of, of, of publications. I don't think that's a bad way to do it either. It's not the way we have chosen to do it in the US. Although again, as the country has become more divided, uh, we've kind of maybe ended up in that spot, some people might say. Uh, but yeah, it's it's a different way of, of going about the challenge of our, of our job. I love this pretty objectivity thing. We're all going for objectivity, um, but I don't know how realistic it is. I don't know. Um, I think there'd, there'd be, thank you for that. I, it's definitely a big, rich topic. Um, I think there's um, a bunch of our um, listeners have some uh, interest in your own specific journey um, and as as an African American journalist, um, and maybe you could talk also about being a foreign correspondent and um, how you know how that came about. Did it give you a certain perspective on American media that you didn't have before, or the sort of the road that's op that was open to you? Yeah, it's a it's a great question. Um, so I was raised by a single mom. Um, again, I was, like I said, I'm from Trent, New Jersey, um, and uh, my mom was just kind of you know amazing force of, you know, we didn't know we were poor uh, <laughs> because uh, she gave us everything we needed and she convinced us that we were as good as anyone else. And so uh, I went on a scholarship at 14 to a very uh, elite uh, boarding school called Lawrenceville near Princeton. Um, and, um, you know, to this day, I'm the only openly LGBTQ trustee. I'm a trustee now in the history of Lawrenceville School. Um, and that's uh, like more than 200 years old. Uh, <laughs> so. Uh, I went to Lawrenceville. From Lawrenceville, I went to Stanford. Um, and all along, my mom had invested me with this confidence of you can do whatever you want to do. Um, Lawrenceville is where I learned, um, because in my neighborhood in Trenton, in Hamilton Township, um, the suburb where I grew up mostly, um, I, I didn't, my world wasn't that big, but you got to this elite prep school and you find out the world is massive and you can do anything you want to do. I'm sure I would have been a lawyer, I probably would have been a doctor and gone to Harvard if I stayed at home because that's all we ever heard of. You could be a doctor, lawyer, or businessman, and the only college was Harvard. Um, so thank God I was saved from that. Fate worse than death and got to go to Stanford. Uh, but, <laughs> uh, 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 but uh it was at Lawrenceville that I realized you can also 
you know, I, I love the French language. I don't know why it had this preternatural love of, of French, things French and, and French language. And so I, at Lawrenceville, I had teachers who spoke French who they're all native speakers. So um, I fell in love with the language. Um, I found out, you know, this whole journalism thing I fell into because there was an exchange student in my dorm uh, from Germany. And someone asked me to write a, a piece for the newspaper about him one day at Q&A. Um, and I thought, wow, you know, this was 1984. Um, you know, uh, there were still, you know, we weren't that far removed from World War II and the German, Germany's trauma of, um, of, of, of getting over that war. Uh, so I asked, I asked my dorm mate all these questions about that and his family and their history. I always wanted to ask him, but, you know, never had occasion to. And it would have been considered rude. So I asked him these questions. I told the whole school the answers. It was awesome. I'm like, oh, this is so fun. Uh, and so that's how I fell into journalism. I never planned to be a journalist. Um, it just worked out. Every summer I, I got internships because my family needed to make money. Uh, and I needed to do money for my scholarship in college. Um, and at work study, I, I worked at Stanford Daily uh, because, again, I needed to make money at work study. I could make it busting tables in food service or checking cards in the library or the Stanford Daily, luckily, um, you know, paid $90 uh, per byline. So that was my work study was working at the Daily. So kind of the necessities of poverty actually allowed me a greater journalism experience than I ever anticipated. It, it came almost by default. Um, and then, uh, then, of course, I decided not to go to law school. And my mother's like, oh, my God, you know, that was a bad financial decision. <laughs> uh, and when I decided to, to, go to, to go into journalism full time. Uh, but, you know, I'm super happy I decided to do it. And it was pretty clear for me I wanted to be a foreign correspondent from the beginning. If I was going to be a journalist, uh, why wouldn't I want to cover the world? It's like many people in my family, I was the first person in my family to go to college, uh, to finish college. Um, and uh, many people had seen the world from my family, but they did it through the service, through the Army, uh, through the Air Force. Uh, and some had been in Germany, actually, for instance. Uh, I felt journalism would allow you to see the world and not have to, like, be shot at. So I'm like, this is amazing. How can I not do this? And so it, the world always attracted me. Um, and I was super happy to get to spend time uh, in Paris and then in Joburg. Um, and yeah, as an American, certainly as an African American, you you learn a lot. Uh, I think every American journalist, every American foreign correspondent um, learns a lot. And you learn how American you are when you're overseas. <laughs> you think you're here, well, I'm the un-American American. Well, no, you're not. You're still an American. Uh, and as African Americans, certainly, we learn a lot about ourselves and our culture, uh, and certainly working on the continent of Africa, uh, I learned a lot about me and my background and my family and how American I was and what still what what were what were in my opinion African essences that carried over through culture and through generations and through the trauma of you know 400 years of, of slavery. Um, it just I felt I still feel very very blessed. I feel like there's no better job in the world than being a foreign correspondent to me, um, and just getting to translate the world for the other parts of the world. And it's a, a role that as an African-American working, you know, in the educated and largely white world and then working in largely white world, I became very comfortable with that role of translator, of translating one set of realities to people who are not part of that reality. Um, it's not fair to call on everyone who's of color to do that. If you're comfortable doing anything, great. Uh, but if you're not, then you also shouldn't be imposed upon to do it. And that's one of the hard things to to um, to manage. I think as a manager and as an employee, it's important to be honest uh, with each other about that. Um, if you're not comfortable in that role, then you should say so. Um, every time there's a, you know, a black story or black question or a Latina or Latinx question, they come to you. Um, if you're comfortable with that, then great. If you're not comfortable with that, you say, you know what I really love? I love business stories. So I love if you talk to me about the business stories. I'm really into this, you know, this race car thing and, and telling the fact, you know, sharing your world, your interest on your passions uh, in that um, with your team, with your boss. Just make sure they don't see you as just one thing. Yeah, that's great advice. Um, we have a couple of our um, audience who, um, you know, people have, usually bring a lot of passion into journalism and they may have political passions um, and interests that uh, maybe they were involved with a campaign at some point before they be decided to become journalists. Um, but there is the um, reality that that would limit their um, 
the perception of them being objective journalists. So the question is, um, you know, h- how can you balance that those personal interests and beliefs um, uh, with uh, the goals of being a, a journalist that can cover a lot of stories um, that is in line with the um, the goals of the organization? And I think that that's changing somewhat at news organizations. They're, they're talking about, you know, can you support Black Lives Matter and cover race and politics in the U.S.? Well, it's, it's, it's really it's really funny, right? Because at CNN, we've actually changed our policy, not, you know, the last, well, since, since the death of George Floyd. So much has changed, right? Since the death of George Floyd. So at CNN, uh, you know, you weren't able to tweet out support of Black Lives Matter before then because it was considered a political statement. But after the death of George Floyd, it, I think the, there was a, a change in the zeitgeist and in the culture itself beyond journalism where people said, wait, why, why is it controversial to say that Black Lives Matter? And so there was this flip. And this happens in our culture, in our society. Uh, and because of that, you can tweet Black Lives Matter now, support. You still can't donate uh, to a political organization. That's not something we allow. There's still a line, right? Um, the line has changed from where it was, but there's still a line. Um, I think it's, it's all about you personally and how what, what, what brings you fulfillment. So if it brings you fulfillment to actually talk about those partisan issues in a partisan way, then you should go work for, keep working for a campaign, find another campaign, work for one of the parties, work for local uh, candidates you believe in. That's all awesome passion. Do that. Um, and this is where I think the old fashioned notion of objectivity really is of some use to us still in journalism. Um, and that is, if you if you feel compelled to, to look at the world from those partisan perspectives, you probably shouldn't be in a newsroom because, I, I mean, I, I, I don't know. I, I can't imagine anyone's partisan perspectives where they think that their perspective is always right. And maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I, I, I can't imagine people like that. We know some of them, uh, some of the republic officials. Uh, I again, as a journalist, I think in our way of thinking about the world, it's really hard to imagine any codified school of thought, be it a religion, be it a political party, be it a, 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 any institution, an educational institution, a workplace institution, a journalism institution, where we can't find some holes, we can't po- poke some holes into into the orthodoxy. I mean, that's what we do, right? That's who we are. We are skeptical people. We love inquiry. Uh, we love pointing out where you're wrong, right? You know, I mean, we all love our moms, but you know, our moms aren't perfect. Uh, and so <laughs> we, there's there's always, I think, a critique um, that can be given to any idea or any notion or or any person or any official, I mean, always. And so if, if, if you feel that way, journalism is a great place to be. And you should not be put off that you have a history working for a campaign. There are lots of journalists with history working for campaigns. George Stephanopoulos was, you know, was was built a high level official in Bill Clinton's world. Uh, well, that's the spokesperson, chief of staff, maybe of both. Um, and and he's now an anchor on ABC News. So don't let that put you off. Uh, that is totally fine. The problem is though, again, when you get into the office, you should not be that Democrat or that Republican or that you know Socialist Party member or that you know Front National, whatever you are. Um, you know, you should not be that when you're a journalist. Um, I, I still, I still, I do adhere to that old-fashioned ideal. These are great. This is a great conversation. Um, uh, what um, I, there's a, there's a bunch of questions about CNN in particular, not surprisingly, um, and uh, you know some simple ones like, do you think we're over covering Trump? Um, are you know what's uh, the dynamic? between, um, you know, running something because you know it's going to get engagement over whether that story is really the right story um, to run sort of the tail wagging the dog situation in political reporting. Yeah, I, so I missed the second part of it. I'm, the first part I got about overcovering from was the Yeah, second? and I mean, uh, what do you think that the media in general is... Um, w- F- publishing news um, with engagement as the first and foremost um, priority and maybe over prioritizing engagement as opposed to the stories awesome. that should be told. Awesome. Uh, so good. Such good questions. Um, are we over covering Trump? You know, it's a question we ask ourselves in every day. Um, 
And I think, you know, there is still a CNN, a, a digital report and a TV report, a linear TV report. Um, um, you all should subscribe to CNN, by the way, your local cable. <laughs> I'm not going to give that commercial, actually. Sorry, I'm going to go back. Um, but it still would be nice if you did. Um, we had our much watched year ever, you know, um, very recently um, with all the COVID stuff. Um, so we're doing fine. But um, I think we have to be everywhere, which is the digital is the answer to that. Um, so we ask we overcome Trump, over, overcome for Trump every day. There are a million different opinions in the newsroom. Um, you know, I, I, I mostly don't think we do. Although, again, as, as you know, the guy whose team puts up the homepage, uh, we debate a lot about when it should lead with Trump and when it shouldn't and how often. Um, and we base it basically based on the story. Um, we don't totally go on engagement. It is true in digital, we met engagement and the metrics matter a lot to us in digital, everywhere in digital throughout news because you can see them. Um, it's not the, engagement is not the most important thing at all. If it were, you know, it, dep it also depends on whose engagement you want. So you can see, is it, uh, do you want a thousand, a million strangers, which we could do easily on a story at CNN digital, um, you know, any cat story, we get a million strangers, right? Um, we don't, really care as much about strangers as we do about people who value CNN and the relationship with our news and our journalists that we work really hard to, 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 to get, uh, to uncover, um, to make. Um, and, and, and that's the relationship we care about. That's the engagement we care about most. Uh, the people who are gonna be there with us, who come to us every day, who want to get information from CNN, uh, that's the people, uh, that's the engagement we care about most. And that engagement actually is usually super high quality stories. It's not, it is not the cat story, certainly. Um, it is uh, stories that matter. It's not every story that matters. I mean, it's something that we talk about a lot on my team. Um, should this story be on the homepage even though people are not clicking on it? Well, it's an important story. So yes, that happens a lot. We said we saw a story should be there that's not doing super well with audience because it's a story that matters. Uh, and then we do think it upon ourselves to say, it's our job to connect, again, as I started at the beginning of all this, right? Uh, with connecting the audience, the content to the audience. And so what can we do as a programming team to work harder to find the angle uh, or the sliver or the uh, the, ta the hook that's going to help um, this story connect with audiences because it's an important story. And if we believe that, then why does our audience, why can't we uh, convince them of that? As a former foreign correspondent, I can tell you some of it is a lack of interest sometimes in the part of the, in the, in the, part of the American audiences for the world. Um, I can't tell you how many stories I did from Bujumbura, you know, <laughs> Burundi, uh, that were super important stories but audiences didn't connect with. Um, and so we keep doing them because it's our job to do them. Um, and at some point, you never know, audiences might connect. So I also covered the, the one of the Bosnian wars, uh, you know, the one around Sar Sarajevo um, and Pale. And no one cared until the whole world cared. And so we keep doing what we need to do as journalists uh, to educate the world. Uh, and we may affect lives that don't have anything to do with metrics or numbers, um, but we keep doing it. Since um, you've been involved with a lot of uh, cohorts of interns um, and presumably some that have come out of uh, bad economic cycles um, like the financial crisis, um, and, and this one probably seems particularly um, high stress given uh, the fact that we're all remote. Um, what, any advice to this class of interns on how to, you know, how to make it in a tough job environment? Uh, I think the most important thing is persistence. So keep going and keep asking. Um, the very first internship I had when I, it's a Trentonian, my, my local paper. And Trent, New Jersey still has two newspapers, which is just amazing. No one has two newspapers, but Trenton does. Uh, so the Trentonian, uh, it wasn't actually an internship. Um, I just called after my freshman year. I just kept calling the newspaper every week to ask if they need anyone to do anything, sweep up or open mail or anything. Um, and then after the, the four, fourth time I called, week four, the editor, the editor, uh, the editor in chief said, oh, you know what? Actually, no, it's a city editor. He said, actually, uh, our calendar girl, that's what they said back in 1980, <laughs> or again, um, the calendar girl just left. And that was the journalist who kept up to date like a thousand listings from what the JC or the Knights of Columbus was doing in Ewing Township. You know, uh, that, that's, that was the job. Uh, and I said, okay, I'll do it. Uh, so I did that on a part-time basis. And, um, he said, there's no bylines, but I, you know, again, being persistent, I, ended, I left there with four bylines. And those four bylines, my stories that I created, that I wrote and reported, uh, they got me an internship the next summer at the Boston Globe. Uh, and so 
the persistence is is key. Um, even though times are not easy, uh, the race will go to the persistent. The persistent will find jobs. There will still be jobs, uh, even in tough economic times. Uh, there will still be jobs, and we'll have to hire people, and we'll have to hire people at all different levels and all different income uh, and salary ranges. And so there will still be jobs. And so uh, be persistent. Maybe not gonna hire a lot of people, but they might, we might hire you. So so don't give up. That's my best advice. And and, and if 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 it's so bad you don't get a job in the beginning, uh, fine, do something else while you wait till it improves. But keep writing, keep writing, uh, keep getting bylines for wherever the bylines are for are from, uh, because that's going to be the thing that gets you a job when there is a job. That's great advice. Does C CNN have interns terms as well? Some people are asking. We do, uh, this, we do have interns uh, every summer and spring and fall. We have interns. Um, this summer has been a little weird because uh, it's not the full fledged program it would have been normally because of the remote uh, work conditions. But um, I hope the remote work conditions end at some point. And I know the program will re return to its full robustness when that happens. Uh, but uh, it's much more scaled back now. But you can go to CNN.com slash jobs, maybe. Um, um, but I'll find out where and, and share it with the Facebook group. That would be great. I think a lot of people are interested in that. So thank you so much, Marcus. And um, and thanks everybody. I'm sorry if I missed some of these questions. I hope we answered a lot, got, had uh, Marcus answer a lot of them. Um, and um, please come back for the, our future um, New Summer School presentations. I think they're very good. Thanks again, Marcus. Thanks everyone. And thanks Laura for doing this. Thank you. Okay, bye.